church, as you are being seated, I just am so grateful for the opportunity to step into this pulpit and to step into God's word with the reminder that we've just been given. I realize we all come in here today from so many different places with so many different circumstances in life and situations that we're navigating and different things that we're carrying or, or holding on to. And, 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 and it can be overwhelming at times. And, and so I just want to say right up front, whether you're new to Shades and if you are welcome or, or if you've been here for a long time, what a beautiful gift it is to be reminded that every time, every time, we open the word of God and every time we, we declare uh, who our God is, we, we are standing on the promise of this truth that our God is faithful forever. He is perfect in love and he is sovereign and he is reigning over all. And this is good news. This is good news that we need to hear. And so as we turn our attention now to the word of God, I'm so excited to be able to step into God's word with that reminder ringing in our ears that, that we are turning our attention to the God who is faithful forever, perfect in love, sovereign over all things, reigning on high and caring about the intricate details of everything that we're walking through today. That's who our God is. How grateful we are for that beautiful reminder on this day. Matthew chapter five is where we're gonna be spending some time. I wanna encourage you to grab your Bible and join me in Matthew's gospel, chapter five, the very beginning of the New Testament. This is the, the most famous recorded sermon that we have from Jesus in the word of God. It's called the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew five, six, and seven. And we are walking through the beginning of this sermon, just several very, very brief, profound statements that Jesus makes at the beginning of this sermon. They, they are often referred to as the Beatitudes. They give us insight into what it means to, to have a life transformed by the power of the gospel. They, they show us a, a glimpse, if you will, of what it means to follow Jesus. Jesus says these will be the attitudes of the heart of those who trust and follow me. That's what the Beatitudes are all about. And today we are, we are looking at the second of these Beatitudes at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. We just began this series last week and we're going to pick up right where we left off, looking at one Beatitude at a time over the next several weeks. And so I want to invite you, if you're willing and able, to stand back up with me just for a moment as we read the Word of God here this morning. And as we turn our attention to God's word, the reason I'm inviting you to stand back up is so that we all can be reminded this is our foundation for the people of God. The church of Jesus Christ stands on the living and active and errant word of God. This is the firm foundation underneath our feet. And when we turn to the Holy Scripture, we are seeing what God says is right and good and true. Listen to this beatitude, Matthew 5, verse 4. Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who mourn. We talked about this last week. Another way that you could translate that word blessed is happy. Happy are those who mourn. What an interesting statement. And Jesus says, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. This is the word of the Lord. Would you pray with me and then we'll be seated. Father, thank you for this time. What a gift it is to be reminded of what we have already heard on this day as voices were being lifted high for your glory and for our good. You are faithful forever. You are perfect in love. You are sovereign and reigning over all. And it's with that truth ringing in our ears that we step into this time believing that you have something specific that you want us to see and hear. And so I pray, Lord God, that your Holy Spirit would move among this place and move in our lives individually and, and show us what we need to see. Lord, use this time 
As we lean in, use this time to draw near to us and show us just a little bit more of who you are and your grace and your mercy and your kindness towards us. Lord, we need you. We pray that you would guide us here. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you for standing with me. Please be seated. What a gift it is to share this time together this morning in the word of God. It is a beautiful spring day outside. It is Master Sunday. Let's go. Don't worry, you'll be out of here in time. I wanna watch it too. We are thrilled to have the privilege of stepping into the word of God together because as we do so in this specific text, we are hearing the words of Jesus. This sermon that was preached by Jesus was heard by many. Matthew 5 tells us the, dis the disciples, the early followers of Jesus, they were walking with him at this time that he preaches this sermon at the Sea of Galilee and what has now become, become known as the Mount of Beatitudes. And, and the scripture also tells us there's a large crowd there. People are showing up to hear from Jesus. They, they want to see what is Jesus going to do next. They want to hear what is Jesus going to say next. And he, he lays out this sermon in a beautiful way, really laying out what it means to, to be a follower of Jesus. What it looks like, what it sounds like. How a follower of Jesus will live and, and believe and, and act. What, what will matter most to a follower of Jesus? That's what we see in the Sermon on the Mount. At the beginning of this sermon, these statements, these beatitudes that we're walking through are such a gift because Jesus is, is showing anyone who will listen, this is actually the pathway to true happiness. What an amazing thing to consider that Jesus would lay out for us, the Son of God would lay out for us the pathway to true happiness because the reality is we all wanna be happy. We are on this constant quest, this pursuit of happiness. We, we long for happiness and Jesus is saying, I want you to know where happiness is found. But one of the things we see is Jesus talks about where happiness is found is these statements are, they are very countercultural. In fact, some of them on the surface are even counterintuitive. That, that's what we're seeing here today. I mean, how in the world could happiness be found through mourning? Blessed are those who mourn. You could literally translate this happy are the sad. That's an interesting thing to consider, right? And you may be here today going, man, this is why I didn't want to come to church because they say these confusing, strange things. Happy are the sad. What does that mean? How, how could happiness be found through mourning and sadness? How could the pathway to happiness be mourning, grieving? Happy are the sad. What does Jesus mean? What does Jesus want us to see? I want to read to you just a quote from a commentary on the Sermon on the Mount written by Dr. Danny Aiken. This is very helpful. It kind of sets the foundation for where we're going with this statement. Dr. Aiken says this, this type of mourning requires a change of heart. Jesus' first concern is not changing our actions, but our spirit. We need to change internally. Mourning in this context is an act of repentance and sorrow over our sin and sinful condition. See, this is helpful because the Beatitudes, they're, they're actually dealing with the inner man. They're actually pointing to what needs to take place in the heart and soul of an individual to, to be a follower of Christ. They're, they're pulling back the curtain, if you will. They're, they're looking behind the scenes in, in our lives and saying, Here, here's what needs to happen in your heart and in your mind to find true happiness. There must be mourning. There must be sadness over 
sin. There must be mourning and sorrow over our sinful condition. Those who mourn their sin are actually led to what the Bible would call repentance. What does that mean? Repentance means to to change a direction, to to have a change. And in this context would mean to change from a life of sin separated from God to a life of faith following after Jesus, to turn from sin, to turn to what Christ alone can provide. To mourn our sin is the pathway to happiness. You see, Jesus is showing us the reality of our sin should lead to mourning. Just put it really simple. The reality of our sin should lead to mourning. Have you ever mourned or grieved or or felt sorrow over something you've done Not because you got caught or or not because you're facing consequences for what you've done, because of the actual pain that it caused to someone that you really care about. First time I remember this happening in my life was in the second grade, all right? And I'm confident, I'm confident that I mourned my sin before second grade, but I'm very confident that I mourned my sin because I had gotten caught because I was facing discipline, because I wanted to shed tears to try and get out of the the consequences of my sin. But in the seventh grade, a specific incident happened in our home where I came face to face with the reality that my sin can cause pain to someone that I love. This actually is a story that my mom helped me remember, and she's here today, so I wanted to make sure I got the details right. I called my mom and said, Mom, did this really happen the way I remember it? She said, yes, you're right on. So here's the way this played out. We had a room in our house growing up that was called the living room. I don't know if y'all have ever heard of something like that. They're not in many houses anymore, but, but some of you may still have a living room or you had a, a living room in the house that you grew up in. And, and here's the thing, I just wanna say this right up front. I don't know why it's called a living room because we weren't allowed to live in there. It was the only room in our house that had like a nice rug on the ground, on the floor. It had some nicer furniture than the rest of the house, okay? And and there were some pretty uh, significant guidelines around what could happen in that room. And I think the guidelines went like this. If someone comes over to the house that has never been to the house before, that is an adult, they're invited to the living room. Everyone else, no, you cannot step foot in the living room. But, but I'm the oldest of three boys, and three boys, you know, we need some space to, to wrestle, and we need some, play, some space inside if it's raining to play football. And, and, and for my brother Andrew and I, the living room just seemed like an awesome space to have a world-class WWF kind of wrestling match. And so one day, my mom is in the kitchen doing something else. The living room's kind of around from the kitchen, and we kind of slide into the the living room, probably because our wrestling match had started somewhere else and just carried into the living room. And we're wrestling around on the rug in there. And I'm sure one of us decided it's a great idea. Let's go off the top rope. And so, you know, somebody goes flying across the room and we're, we're rolling around on the floor. And then as we're wrestling around, we kick a little side table that's on the edge of the wall in the living room. And on this side table were some very important little items. We weren't paying attention. One of the things that was on that side table was this beautiful little crystal bell. Not a crystal ball, you know, not, not talking about a Disney story here, a crystal bell, like a ringy dingy kind of thing, all right? And when we hit that table, that beautiful crystal bell, it fell off the table onto the floor to the other side of the rug, and it just shattered into many different pieces. That bell was destroyed. And when that bell shattered, my my mom heard the, the ruckus and heard the noise and heard what took place, and she came into the living room. And much to my surprise... Instead of coming into the living room to scold us and to tell us that we shouldn't have been in there and to discipline us, my mom saw that bell on the ground and she just immediately began to weep. Now this is bad news for a second grade boy. I realized that I had caused my mom some significant pain. You see, that bell actually had belonged to my mom's grandmother. It was my great-grandmother's little crystal bell, and it meant a lot to my mom because it was something that mattered to my grandmother, and now it was in our home, and now this bell is shattered on the ground, and I'm the reason it shattered. 
And my mom is, is upset, but she's not like angry. Like she's hurt, which is way worse. I'm like, why can't you just be angry? Like, just give me a spanking or something, but don't be crying. I mean, like, this is breaking my heart. And I was feeling the weight of the pain that my actions had caused someone that I love. And then my mom, because she's an amazing mom, she sees that I'm upset, sees that I'm actually crying over making her cry. She begins to comfort me. It's an amazing thing to experience. See, Jesus is saying to us in a much more significant way than, 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 a, than a family keepsake or a trinket or, or even a relationship that, that we have where we cause pain here in this life. Jesus is saying we must understand the reality of our sin. We must come face to face with the, the destructive power of our sin so that it leads us to mourning. Why? Why? Because the reality is it is our sin that separates us from a right relationship with God. And true happiness will not be found outside of a right relationship with God. We will look, we will look, we will look, we will try anything we can to find happiness, but that happiness we find will be momentary and fleeting unless it is happiness that is built on a right relationship with God. See, the reality is our sin separates us from God. And our sin is actually an act of rebellion against a God who is faithful forever a God who is perfect in love and a God who is reigning sovereign over all. The scripture gives us some insight into this in the book of Psalms. The, the Psalm I would ask you to turn to is Psalm 51. This is a Psalm of King David. King David, a very prominent king among the people of God, a king who led the nation of Israel into great prosperity, a time of of great celebration underneath King David, his reign and his rule and his authority. He, as a younger man, was called a man after God's own heart. This is, this is the same David who killed Goliath with a slingshot. I mean, David is a very significant man in the word of God and among the people of God. But David got caught up in some very destructive sin. In fact, David one day is on his rooftop and he sees off in the distance a, a beautiful woman that goes down to the creek to, to bathe. Her name is Bathsheba. And David looks at this woman as she's bathing in the creek and he says, I want her for myself. Even though she was married, David says, no, no, I, I want her. And so, so David sends for her and, and takes her and, and lies with her. The, the scripture tells us in the story uh, of David and Bathsheba then becomes pregnant by David, a man who's not her husband. And David, in an attempt to cover up what he's done, he sends her husband, Uriah, who's in the army, to the front lines of the battle so that he will be killed. King David has this adulterous relationship, and then to cover it up, has a man murdered. And then he comes face to face with his sin as God sends someone to confront him and he sees the reality of what he's done and what he's tried to cover up and what he's tried to fix in his own power that he cannot repair. And as he comes face to face with his sin, David realizes the, the, the gravity and the reality of the destructive power of the sin in his own heart. And he pours out his heart to God in, in, this, in this prayer, this psalm, this song of worship, just crying out to God. And he says this in Psalm 51 verse three, for I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me against you and you only, David says, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Catch what David says here. This is so incredible and so important. As David comes face to face with his sin, he does not say, against Bathsheba have I sinned. It was true, he sinned against Bathsheba. He does not say, against Uriah, I have sinned. Because it was true. He was the reason Uriah was killed and 
battle. He sinned against Uriah. No, David realizes at a, at a greater level of depth and gravity, his sin actually is sin against a holy God, against the most high God. David says, it is against you, God, that I have sinned. You deal with me however you see fit. I deserve justice. I deserve judgment for the things that I've done. God, it's against you that I have sinned. He would go on to say in Psalm 51, so I need what only you can provide. Create in me a clean heart. I can't clean up my heart. I can't clean up my life. I can't clean up the things I have done against a holy God. I need you, Lord God, to do for me what I cannot do for myself. David had turned away from God's best. He had turned away from what God says is right and good and true. His sin had overtaken him and had led him to do things that I'm sure he never thought he would do. And he realizes He realizes the destructive power of the sin in his life and he mourns. He's mourning the reality of sin. It's very interesting that David's, one of David's sons is a guy by the name of Solomon. The king who would follow David, King Solomon, called the wisest man who ever lived. The the book of Proverbs in the word of God is given to us mostly through Solomon's writings. He also wrote wisdom in the book of Ecclesiastes. And Solomon, listen to what Solomon says. In Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 2, he says, It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For this is the end of all mankind, and the living will lay it to heart. Sorrow, the wisest man who ever ever lived said this, sorrow is better than laughter, for by sadness of face, the heart is made glad. What an interesting statement. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. What is Solomon saying here? Solomon's saying, uh, look, you must understand. This is a king who had everything that the world had to offer. This is a king who not only was the wisest man who ever lived, he was, well, at the time, the wealthiest man who ever lived. He had everything the world had to offer. And he says that only a fool will not take sin seriously. Only a fool will ignore their sin or act like their sin is no big deal. Only a fool will try to cover up their sin. Any attempts to ignore our sin and brokenness, any attempts to numb our sin and brokenness, they are a fool's errand because they only lead to greater sin and brokenness. Solomon is saying, no, it is the wise who mourns his sin because in mourning our sin, we are led to repentance. And please don't miss this. This is so important. In mourning our sin, we are led to repentance and in repentance, we are led to grace. And this is the good news of what Jesus is saying here in this profound beatitude. Blessed are those who mourn, who mourn their sin, who repent of their sin, for they shall be comforted by the comforter who lavishes them with amazing grace. You see, mourning our sin invites us into the comfort of the Savior. Mourning our sin invites us into the comfort of the Savior, and it is in the comfort of the Savior and his amazing grace extended to us through the finished work of the cross and the power of an empty tomb that defeated sin and death once and for all. It is there that we can find the true happiness that we long for in being made right with God. Mourning our sin leads to repentance. Repentance leads to grace. Grace is extended by the comforter. 
the one who has done for us what we could never do for ourselves. This is the gospel right here in this beatitude. I, I wanna share a definition of the gospel that I have shared on many occasions. It's one of my favorite descriptions of the gospel because of how easy it is to understand and yet how powerful it is when it is understood. This is from Pastor Timothy Keller. He said this years ago, he said, the gospel is this. We are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever ever dared to believe, yet at the very same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. Mourning our sin is mourning the reality of our depravity, the reality of the darkness of our sin that is darker than we probably even want to acknowledge or admit. But it leads us, it leads us to the comforter, to the grace of God who loves us more than we could possibly comprehend. He is faithful forever. He is perfect in love and he is sovereign over us. This is what the Savior has done. We must come face to face with the fact that we are sinners in need of a savior before we can see, truly see, and receive the good news of what this savior has done. Now, I wanna turn your attention real quickly to the, to the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John, we're just gonna spend a few minutes here before I wrap this up. John chapter four is where I wanna turn your attention because in John four, we see one of my favorite examples in the scripture of, of how this plays out in an encounter with Jesus. John chapter four tells the, the story of, of Jesus traveling through an area called Samaria. And as he travels through Samaria, he comes to a well in the middle of the day, thirsty, ready for something to drink. And, and he encounters a woman there. Now, we don't know a whole lot about this woman. In fact, she's often just referred to as the woman at the well. But we are given some insight into her story and we are given some insight into the significance of this encounter. And so I wanna read this just to set a little context. This is John chapter four, beginning in verse five. This helps us understand what's taking place in this encounter. And then we're gonna see a little bit more of this woman's story as we move ahead. It says this in John four. So he, being Jesus, came to a town of Samaria called Sychar near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph and Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well and it was about the sixth hour. And a woman from Samaria came to draw water and Jesus said to her, give me a drink for the disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. And the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? Now, the context here is so incredibly important because Jesus is in a region, in an area where a good religious Jew would never go. The Jews hated the Samaritans. They looked at them as second-class citizens. They, they looked at them as half-breeds. The, the Jews looked down their nose with spite at the Samaritans. And as a result, the Samaritans, of course, they hated the Jews because of the way they were treated, because of the things that the Jews had said about them and to them and the way they were avoided and ostracized by the religious Jews. This is good old fashioned racism and classism is what we see between the Jews and the Samaritans. But Jesus steps right into the middle of it. He blows right past the racial lines, the dividing lines. In fact, it even says that he he had to go to Samaria. He's there for a reason. And as he's there having this conversation with a woman who, who the culture would say, you should not talk to her. She's lower than you. She's not the same as you. She, she's not worthy. We see that this is a woman that actually has a very painful past. And we see that because John inspired by the Spirit of God, includes the time of day that this encounter took place. 
John 4 says it was about the sixth hour. What does that mean? It's about the sixth hour after the sun had come up. So this is the middle of the day, probably around 12 o'clock or one o'clock. It is the hottest part of the day. Why does that matter? Well, it matters because you don't do your hardest work in the middle of the day if you can avoid it. Drawing well from a water was very difficult work. It was work that the woman of the house was often the one responsible for doing this work. She would have to carry a very heavy jar with her to the well. She'd have to lower something down in the well to pull the water up, to fill the jar, to then carry the even heavier jar filled with water back to the house for her family to have the water that they need. This was not easy work. And so the women would often gather at the well at the beginning of the day before the heat of the day. And this was a time when the women would often be interacting, they'd be sharing stories, they'd be talking about what was going on in their life. This woman who Jesus meets at the well in the middle of the day, she doesn't wanna be seen around anybody else. She doesn't wanna go to the well when other people are there. She wants to go to the well by herself. Why is that? She's had a difficult story. We get some insight here. John chapter four, if you jump down to verse 16, as Jesus and this woman interact, Jesus says, well, why don't you go get your husband and bring him back here and we'll continue this conversation a little bit further. John chapter four, verse 16, Jesus said, go call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Now I wanna stop there for a second. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where a topic comes up and you're thinking, oh gosh, I really hope they don't ask me a specific question about that because something happened in my life that I'm not proud of. So there's something going on in my life that I just don't want to talk about. And so you give a little half truth, you know, just to move on with the conversation. The woman says, well, I don't have a husband. You know, trying to move away from that conversation. And Jesus actually responds to her, well, hold on. I actually know your story. I know your story. That's what the scripture reveals. Verse 17 and 18 says, Jesus said to her, you are right in saying I have no husband for you've had five husbands and the one that you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. This is a woman whose story has been filled with significant pain. Her story has been filled with significant brokenness. Her story has been filled with significant sin. Sin that she doesn't wanna talk about. Sin that she would rather avoid, sin that she would so much rather avoid talking about that she chooses to go to the well in the middle of the day so that she can be all by herself and not have to interact with anyone else. This is a woman who has lived through loss. She's experienced great pain. We don't know the details of these five husbands and, and what happened. We don't know if it was divorce, if, if they left her. We don't know if they died. We don't know what's going on here. But what we do know is it's led her to a place where, where she feels so broken and so challenged in her story that she's just given up on marriage altogether. So now she's living with a guy that's not her husband. She's living in sin. And Jesus says, look, I, I know your story. I, I know what's going on. And Jesus brings her face to face with the reality of her story, her brokenness, her sin, her pain, not to make her feel worse, not to pile on here, please, please hear this, but to call her to something greater in the comfort that the Savior alone can provide through his mercy and his grace. That's what's happening here. Jesus says, I know your story. I know all that you've walked through. I know it's been painful. I want you to see the reality of what you have experienced in the brokenness and in the sin of your life because if you see this clearly and you mourn what has happened, you are being invited into something that will absolutely change your story altogether. And what's so amazing is what happens in this woman's life when she is brought face to face with her brokenness. If you jump down to verse 25, we see that everything begins to change for this woman. Verse 25, it says, the woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming. He who is called the Christ. This is a, a woman who actually is spiritual. She's religious in, in some form or fashion. And she says, when the Messiah comes, he's gonna tell us all these things. 
And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. I who speak to you am he. The Messiah is here. Just then it says there was a little interruption as the disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with a woman, but no one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking to her? They've been around Jesus just long enough to go, hey, we probably should let this play out a little bit. So it says the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? Church, please hear this. I, I hope, you, hope you can see the significance of what's happening in this story. It is unbelievable. The, the, the invitation that this woman is given and the change that takes place. Her story of shame becomes a story of grace. She is confronted with her sin. She realizes the reality of the destruction and, and what's taken place through sin in her story as Jesus lays it out in front of her. And what does she do? What does she do? She doesn't run and hide. She doesn't cower. She feels liberated. She feels free. She's encountered the comforter and the comforter has come to her with grace. And so what does she do? She drops the very thing that she was holding that physically represents all of her brokenness, all of her pain, all of her shame. She lays down the water jar and she goes into town to find all the people that she wanted to avoid. And she said, hey, I've got a story to tell. You got to hear what happened to me. I just met a man who told me everything I've ever done, and it was incredible. Now, that's a weird thing to consider. Can you imagine right now if I said, okay, the way we're going to wrap up this service, uh, you in the back, I'm going to ask you to come on down front, stand right here, and we're going to talk about every detail of every sin you've ever committed. Won't that be fun? Aren't you going to feel great about yourself? No, that sounds like an absolute nightmare. I don't want everyone to know the details of all my sin. You don't want everyone to know the details of all your sin. But this woman says, I just met a man who told me everything that I ever did, and it has changed my story. How can that be possible? How can that be possible? One word, grace. She has encountered the comforter and the grace of God in a way that she never had experienced before, and it changes everything for her. In fact, John goes on to say in verse 39, many Samaritans from that town believed in him, Jesus, because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. This woman is literally a new creation. She cannot help but talk about it. She's got to go into town and tell all the people that she wanted to avoid what Jesus has done for her. Her story of shame becomes a testimony of grace. And here's the deal. As we wrap up, it is not easy to come face to face with our sin. It is not easy to, to, to see the reality of our sin. But when we see the reality of our sin in light of the good news of the gospel, we can mourn what we have done knowing that the comforter is providing for us exactly what we need. This is the amazing grace of the Savior. The grace of God encounters this woman in her need, in her sin, and she is set free. Church, do you know what that's like? Have you encountered the grace of God in such a way that that story of shame story of brokenness, it actually becomes a testimony of transformation because of what Christ has done for you. This is what the gospel provides. And church, the good news for all of us is that the gospel 
not, does not stop at the place of salvation. The gospel does not stop at the place of comfort in the midst of our sin. No, the good news is that the gospel actually tells us there is a hope, a hope that is given to those who trust in Christ that is so much greater than anything we will experience in this life. And here's why we need to hear that. This is where we're gonna close today because the reality is even for those who have received the grace of God and received the gift of the comforter through salvation, through trusting in Christ. We know the world is still broken. I mean, many of you are walking through difficult stories right now. Stories of pain, stories of hardship, stories of loss. We know that uh, the world is still broken. But please don't miss this. Jesus promises that our mourning will end and his comfort will be eternal. Jesus promises that our mourning will end and the comfort that he provides will not just be for this life, it will be forevermore in a place with him where there is no mourning. That's the promise we have in the good news of the gospel. Listen to the words of the apostle John in Revelation 21, the divine inspired revelation given to John of the things to come. He says this, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. The dwelling place of God is with man. God cannot dwell where, where a world is ravaged by sin. The dwelling place of God is with man means something has happened. Something has happened. What has happened? The price for sin has been paid. And as a result, those who are in Christ know that the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. A day is coming for those who are in Christ where there will be no mourning. How can that be? Because mourning is necessary where there is sin and brokenness and pain. But when sin and brokenness and pain that has been dealt with at a cross, that has been dealt with through an empty tomb, when Christ returns, that sin and brokenness and pain that still exists in the world around us and still exists in our story, it will come to an end once and for all. And we who are in Christ will be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing in the presence of God forevermore our living eternal hope. This is the good news. And you don't want to miss it. This is what Christ has done for you. It's the only place you will find true happiness. It's the only hope that lasts beyond this life. Turn to Jesus, our living hope, the good news that has been provided through a cross and an empty grave. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for this message from Jesus himself. Blessed are those who mourn their sin, for they shall be comforted. Lord, I pray for anyone among us who has never received the comfort of your grace. May today be the day. May today be the day. And Lord, for those among your people, your church, your followers who have trusted in you, Lord, I pray that you would give us the faith to live with an eye on the hope that you have promised that there is coming a day when mourning will cease to exist because we will be with you forevermore. Praise be to God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.